again. I was with you earlier. I'm uh, Owsley Brown, feeling tongue-tied. Uh, my mother, Christy Brown, who I think will find the words more easily than me. And uh, my job now is to, uh, is to um, read two biographies that really make me very, very happy, and uh, I am honored and humbled to be able to read, uh, who will be moderating uh, this next half of this evening's program, and then Mom will uh, give the uh, the uh, the star of the evening's uh, biography to you, and then we'll just all have this whatever we're going to have next, which I have a feeling is going to be great. Mom says it's going to be a love-in. It already feels like a love-in to me. Um, um, so here it goes. This is in your program, but it's such a nice thing to be able to to, to give. Of, of, of spoken word after such incredible spoken word to these next amazing people that I have the joy of introducing. Omid Safi is a leading Muslim public intellectual in the United States, and he writes a column for On Being. I know a bunch of On Being fans among us. He is, the, he is a director of or he is director of the Duke University Islamic Studies Center, where he specializes in the study of Islamic mysticism and contemporary Islam, and frequently writes in on, excuse me, liberationist traditions of Dr. Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. He is committed to traditions that link together love and justice. Good idea. He is among the most popular speakers on Islam in mainstream media. Hold your applause. That's Mighty applause worthy. Thank you, Omid, so much for being here. Um, a friend to me I should, should lead off with, which is, is, is makes this uh, all the more meaningful, Sharon, to welcome you, uh, is Sharon Salzberg, who is a central figure in the field of meditation, a world-renowned teacher, and a New York Times bestselling author and New York City gal. She has played a crucial role in bringing meditation and mindfulness practices into the West. You can say that again. And into mainstream culture since 1974. She is co-founder of the Insight Meditation Society in, I always say it wrong, it's Barrie, in Barrie, Mass. And the author of 10 books, including Real Love, which I know we have for sale here. Sharon offers a secular, modern approach to Buddhist teachings, making them readily accessible and how, I can say, and those of us that have been here this week know how wonderful it is to have you. Sharon, thank you, and please hold your applause. Uh, Mom, we let you go now. Okay. Okay. So I'll take that away. As you can tell, I um, have never been as organized as my wonderful son, <laughs> but I sure am proud of him, as I know each of you are. So I uh, thank you. Yeah. And that's what this is all about, right? Pride and love and community and finding the opportunity to be together to share and to care with one another. And so we, and I know Alzi's had the opportunity to have this microphone every morning and every afternoon. And so I wanna just add my thanks to each of you, who of course I can't see, but for being the real festival, which I know Alzi said that, but it's true. And then also to thank our friends around the world who are listening and watching from around the world, because this is what building a healthy community is all about. And so my welcome is to one of the most extraordinary ambassadors of health and all policies, Diane Rehm, a woman who understands to her core and has for over 40 years how to use her voice, a voice that is often physically suffering, but yet never prevailing in that way, but whose heart and whose soul has allowed us to know that each of us are important, that each of us are instruments of peace, and that each of us are in fact our own health and all policy ambassadors. A woman who continues 
to relentlessly inspire us. So it's a tremendous honor to re-welcome Diane to her old Kentucky home because she, like those of you from Kentucky, adores Kentucky, was here for the Derby just a year ago, and she was the hit of the Kentucky Derby, and we'll get her back the next time, but we're thrilled to have her here today. And so, Diane, thank you so much, my dear, for being here. Take yeah. care. And that was beautiful. Yes, and now we want to welcome everyone to the stage. Can you give a hand? Great. I'm really going to stop talking, but I have one thing. I'm not quite sure why I was asked to do this, except that I can see. Anyway, Diane, you were loved by the people to the right and the left of you who wanted you to have a signed copy of two of their books. So I'm now presenting to you from your friends on the right and the left, their <laughs> offers, uh, their two of their latest books. Here we are. Wonderful. Yes, yeah, so, so just you. so you know. Thank you. From them to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, beautiful. And there's a theme. Gosh. <laughs> Radical love, teachings from the Islamic mystical tradition, and real love, the art of mindful connection. Beautiful, beautiful books. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> How do we begin after those glorious young women? Mm. Really, truly, <laughs> truly, <laughs> just marvelous. Extraordinary courage. Uh, is someone going to do the time thing for us? Or are we going to wing it? <laughs> <laughs> We're in that realm beyond time. Oh, <laughs> the realm beyond. I like that. I get it. <laughs> like, that was so extraordinary. I'm, Really touched. So, and uh, thank you so much for doing this. I feel like we're in bizarre world. I've been laughing all week at the thought <laughs> of asking the incomparable <laughs> oh, interviewer questions. Come on. You know, bizarre world where everything's like upside down and inside out. <laughs> so let's enter together. Good. Um, I know that you were raised in a very uh, certain kind of traditional family and community, and through the course of your young adult life, you made some big decisions to start your career and, and move forward. And could you tell us a little bit about your inner sense at that time, that sense of um, moving out or making those decisions, making those, those choices? Well, you're absolutely right. I was raised in a very traditional and strict and large Arab family. Uh, my mother and father were both born in Mersin, Turkey. Um, my mother's family then immigrated to Alexandria, Egypt. My father's family, after Syria and Lebanon were created. Uh, my father's family moved to Lebanon. Um, and as it happens, I was just on Ellis Island this week for the mm -hmm. very first time. And I walked in and, you know, I, I mean, this is a huge search. But I walked up to the fellow after I had had absolutely no success with the computer <laughs> and said, now, uh, what do I do next? And he looked at me and he said, you know, he said, April is Arab American month and your name has been right in front of me. 
and he had my number and my father's history, my mother's history, everything right in front of him. So I got my, when my father and his sister came in 1911, my father was 16 at the time. He was drafted into the US Army two years later, served in France at the end of World War I. Um, he went back in 1929 to Alexandria, Egypt, and this is the part I do not understand. Since they were both born in Mersin, Turkey, the families must have known each other. And my dad went to Alexandria and plucked my mother out of an engagement to another man. Wow. <laughs> and brought her here to the United States I think he must have promised her the moon. I really do. And since she came with no one, and he had his seven sisters and brothers here, it was not easy for her. And therefore, you know, she died when I was 19, before I was the age where I was allowed to ask questions. I don't know if you experienced the same thing in your family, but in my family, and maybe this is why I got into talk radio, I was never allowed to ask questions. Yeah. Whatever was said was going to be the way it was. And this is to get into your question. When my mother uh, was 49, she died, and I was 19. And just before she died, I knew she wanted me to marry an Arab. And so I did. And she was lying on the sofa in the living room. Um, she died two months after we were married. And um, what he thought he was getting... <laughs> was an Arab wife. And I guess I had a different sense of who I was. So I got the first divorce that the Arab community in Washington had ever seen. And it was not easy. Mm -hmm because I was shunned. Um, it was a terrible time. Um, but I knew I had to free myself not only from the idea of being an Arab wife who cooked and cleaned and fixed the dinner and watched her husband go lie on the sofa while she did the dishes. And I'm looking over there wondering, what is this guy doing? What is he all about? So I freed myself from that. Um, and married John Ream to whom I was married for 54 years. He was a great love. He was um, an attorney at the State Department. I was a secretary at the State Department. 
He played on the men's softball team. I played on the women's softball team. And before you knew it, we got to talking about more than softball. <laughs> and we made a bet on that year's World Series uh, for a dinner, and I won the bet. And uh, then toward the end of his life, he got Parkinson's disease and decided his life would come to an end. So he stopped eating, he stopped drinking, he stopped taking medication, and it took 10 days for him to die, which is why I have become an advocate for the right to die in communities all over the country. So that's the long and short of it. Thank you. You know, I, I, sometimes people say that you know that immigrant communities become fully American when we start divorcing at the same rate as the rest of America. You wanted us to become Americanized, yeah. voila, yeah. we are Americanized. Are you happy now? Yeah. <laughs> you know? But they were gone, that's the point. If they had still been living, I could not have done yes. it. it. Because it would have humiliated them. So, you know, and I think about that all the time. My father died 11 months after my mother did of a totally broken heart. And if they had not died, I could not have left that marriage. I could not have shamed them. Did you experience any of the same sense of communal guilt and pressure thinking about that initial divorce and thinking about the public conversation about letting a great love of your life choose how he would end his life? Oh, what an interesting question. No, and I'll tell you why. Um, because my mother and father had died so young, my mother 49, my father 62, um, John Reem's father had taken his life at 72, mm -hmm. his mother had taken her life at 92. Wow. So there was wow. a lot of self um, decision making in that family and my family. And so we talked about death and dying a lot and we both promised each other and we talked about this in front of our children. Um, we talked about the fact that Neither of us wanted um, to prolong, not prolong life, but prolong death. And there's a big difference. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I knew what he wanted, and he knew what I wanted. And both of us seemed so healthy for so long that you never know. Life is a gift, which is why we are all here today, mm -hmm. watching these wonderful young people grow and flourish and learn that their lives are important every single day. I believe that. I so believe that. One of the um, themes of this gathering has been uh, the dark night of the soul and suffering that people go through. And somehow interwoven with that has been love. Absolutely. Um, so I don't know if there's something clearly you've been through. And even at a very young age, you had been through quite a lot. And if you could say something about the strengths that uh, helped you through and that came from that? 
Well, um, in 1992, as a radio broadcaster, I began losing my voice. And it started with a tiny cough <laughs> in the middle of the sentence. And I went to doctor after doctor after doctor for six years, and they kept putting tubes down my throat. And I swear, I think that that's in part why I have spasmodic dysphonia. But in the end, on that last day I was on the air, I could barely get my words out. It was horrible. So I had to go downtown right after I got off the air to moderate a discussion at the Four Seasons, and then I rushed back to the studio and went to my boss, and I said, I'm out of here. And he said, what do you mean you're out of here? And I said, I got to find out what's wrong with my voice. I know there are public radio personnel in this audience, but he said to me, you can't go, next week is fundraiser. <laughs> and I said, I gotta go, I gotta go. And for four months, Four months, I sat at home. I wouldn't pick up a telephone. I wouldn't go out of the house. I wouldn't even go to the drugstore because I couldn't say my own name. And finally, my husband and my doctor said, you know, you've got to go to Johns Hopkins. We've got to find out if you've got Parkinson's or ALS or throat cancer or something. Well, after six years and doctors saying over and over again, it's all in your head. I get to Johns Hopkins and within one hour, a neurologist and a voice specialist tell me I have spasmodic dysphonia. They gave me the first Botox shot I had ever had. And the doctor then said, all right, John, now take her back to the hotel and get her a very cold glass of champagne. <laughs> And I've been drinking it ever since. <laughs> I'd love to um, come back to these remarkable young ladies that we just had on the stage a minute ago. I think nine of them, if I'm not nine mistaken. Yeah. Um, and as I'm thinking about their experiences, their narratives, um, I think four of them coming from international Muslim Somalia, background, Somalia, yeah, to Pakistan and yeah. Iraq, right. um, some coming from uh, impoverished and challenged African American communities, also impoverished white communities, um, Hispanic backgrounds, refugee experiences. Um, and there's a, there a lot of the experiences that they're describing uh, are political, um, refugees or um, economic, you entered a field which, even today, but certainly more so back then, um, how do we put this delicately, was not known as the most welcoming place for strong women? I wasn't strong, not then. Mm. I was scared to death. I walked in as a volunteer. Uh, I had my first interview with the host 
of what was then called the Home Show at WAMU in Washington, D.C. Um, and she said, of course, we welcome you as a volunteer. Come in next Monday and you can start. I was so scared that day, I asked John Ream to drive me because I was shaking. And I got to the door and the host of the program did not meet me. Instead, it was the manager of the station, Susan Harmon who said, you must be the new volunteer. And I said, yes. And she said, well, I have some sad news. Um, the host is out sick. <laughs> and I'm thinking she's going to say to me, so turn around, go right back home. Instead, she said to me, so I, Susan Harmon, <clears throat> am going to do the program, and I'd like you to come into the studio and do it with me. Wow. I had never seen a round table with microphones on it. I had never seen a studio before. But march in, I did, and for 90 minutes, wow. we talked to, God, it would be in the most boring program you've <laughs> ever heard, 90 minutes to a representative <laughs> of the Dairy Council. <laughs> now, all I can tell you is, as a mom, because I had been at home for 14 years, I knew about butter, I knew about milk, I knew about meat, and I totally disagreed with the Department of Agriculture's pyramid of food. I thought it was all upside down. And so I asked her, you know, I said, well, why is butter up here and why is meat up here? And, you know, I knew darn well it was because of various lobbies in our country. And that was my introduction. And I think that since then, except for vacations and those four months, I've been on the air every day for about 40-some years. Fabulous. Thank you. That's so fabulous. Crazy. So what I want to say to those young women is you keep writing. You keep doing what you're doing. Because... I got home, and I swear to you, I got home. I was so excited. I was so happy. And John Ream, always my greatest cheerleader, said to me, I swear, he said, someday you're going to be the host of that program. Well. And I said, will you leave me alone? I'm just a volunteer. Don't scare me to death. So he saw it. Oh, mm -hmm. It was lovely. Yes, it beautiful. was lovely. It was beautiful. So even when we're scared, keep going. Well, and I wonder about you. Did you have times when you were scared? Totally. <laughs> Maybe not so long ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, we can, we'll mix up the order because we were supposed to reverse the questioning in a minute, but um, why not? We'll just Whatever. Do that. Yes, yeah. when I first Whatever. began teaching, I was completely petrified of public speaking. And the format of our intensive retreats, meditation, 
retreats was that there was practice and there was questions and answers and things during the day, but there was one formal lecture every night. Could never do it, never. Uh, I had a colleague, a co-teacher, um, he had to speak every night, and people would go up and yell at him and say, why don't you let her have a voice? <laughs> you know, why won't you let her speak? And I was just too petrified. And it was a whole process that actually um, came down to. My big fear was that I'd be speaking and my mind would go completely yeah. blank, and I would yeah. just like sit there. Yeah. But I knew there was one particular guided meditation called loving kindness, which had a guided practice to it. So I thought, okay... If I give a talk on that topic and my mind goes blank, I can launch into the guided meditation and no one will ever know. Nobody will know. So I gave one talk for about three years, over and over and over and over and over again. I have a pile of cassette tapes. And in a way, that practice has become the most important element of my own practice uh. and in my writing and in my teaching. So it's, it's quite Lovely. interesting. It worked. It worked. It worked. Yeah. We all have fears um, that John Reem used to say to me, you have to learn to adopt your fears and allow them to become part of you, and then they won't take hold of you you take hold of them. And for these young women, I mean, surely there had to have been a fair amount of fear and hesitation, not only about the writing, the initial writing, but then standing up in front of this wonderful audience here in this beautiful auditorium, and speaking about it. So, I mean, we all have those fears. There's just no question of it. And we, we need to learn to live with them. Absolutely. And you? <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> well, um, I'm the guy who had to go twice to the bathroom right before coming on the stage. <laughs> For you to admit that I just went once. Because you know, because I'm going to be on the stage with Diane freaking Ream <laughs> and Sharon Salzberg, and you know, um, and you're wonderful. You know, no, you're you. wonderful. You're oh. wonderful. It's really. um, but I think you know, there's ways that that kind of excitement is because this moment. This conversation, this community, this is a once in a lifetime occasion. And there will be other beautiful conversations, God willing, inshallah. Of course, inshallah. But, but, but this conversation, this is once. And you want to honor this moment, you want to be present in this moment. And for me, the, the excitement that comes with it is part of the fuel for being here Absolutely. and bringing us together. Here. And, and the fear can really ignite yeah. you yeah. to do an even better job, exactly. which you are doing. Thank you. <laughs> and you had, you had a um, John uh, who told you someday you're going to be the host of that show. And there were a few people in my life who told me, you'll never be able to do this. Um, a teacher of mine that told me, don't bother applying to college, because people like you are not cut out for college. Um, for every one of those, there have been other ones, people who've just loved on me. Uh, graciously, without asking for anything, they, they saw me. And they saw a kid, not all that different than the young ladies up here, but nowhere as polished. Like, y'all are good. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm telling you. Absolutely. You are. Y'all are good. Like, as we would say in North Carolina, honey, you shine. <laughs> you know? And to have one person, it can be a teacher, it can be a parent, it can be a friend, it can be a partner, somebody who looks at you and sees you, sees your heart, sees your soul, and just lets you know, I'm with you in your boat. Well, and sometimes it takes um, failure to teach. Um, I can remember in my junior year of high school, and maybe you all, some of you have experienced this, when teachers and students trade roles. And I <laughs> traded roles with my gym teacher. I was a fairly good athlete, but this was not an, a gym class. In fact, it was a hygiene class <laughs> for girls. And you know what I learned? I learned that if you try to wing it and you don't prepare, hmm. you're in deep doo-doo. <laughs> and that was my morning. Huh. I did not prepare sufficiently. I thought I could do this. And I went in there without preparation. And luckily, after that fiasco was over, my gym teacher took me out in her car and said, would you like a cigarette? <laughs> <laughs> And she did not berate me. She did not fuss at me. She just said, you know, sometimes the best way you learn is by trying to do it. And I over-prepared for every single interview I ever did on the air. Yeah. So it was a great lesson. You really do learn. You, do. you really do learn. You know, I'm, I'm also detecting a theme with people who've been good to you. One of them gives you cigarettes. One of them gives you cold champagne. <laughs> I'm just wondering if I want to be your friend, <laughs> what's left out there? Like dark chocolate or, you know? Dark like, good. <laughs> I could go for, you dark, could go for chocolate. dark chocolate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. But you're already my friend. Oh, you. You're already my friend, truly. Oh, so truly, both of you. Both of you. So you have been writing for. Um, Krista Tippett's program. You've been writing columns for her. Um, tell me about that. Krista is someone with whom, on the same day, it's one of the proudest days in my life, Krista Tippett and I each received the National Humanities Medal right. at the White House. From President Barack Obama. Woo! One of the proudest moments in my so life. And um, she is uh, a gifted interviewer. She has a very soft manner about her. Tell me how you got involved in that effort. Yeah, um, so Krista and I have a friendship that goes back to that eventful year of 2001. Um, 
where on a fateful Tuesday mm. morning, mm. Um, something truly terrible yeah. happened yeah. in our world. And, you know, being a do-gooder, I was like, I'm going to put my nerd power to some good use. And what can I do? I, I'm a teacher. I teach. So let me teach, but instead of sitting in a classroom, let me go talk to people using media. So I did about a thousand interviews wow. in the first few months after September 11. And after a while, um, I should have just pressed play because it was the same questions. Why do they hate us? Yeah. Why is Islam uniquely violent? Yeah. Um, you know, so on and so forth. And, and they were not really interested in nuance. Like there was no interest in, well, you know, um, slavery, uh, you know, colonialism, you know, the Holocaust, like that was not on the table. Um, and then I had this conversation with Krista where, as she often does, she said, tell me about the spiritual background of your childhood. And so I got to talk about my, my mama's love and the fact that I've never had to question the fact that I'm worth something because my mama and my baba have loved on me and they've introduced me to beautiful love poetry and this was the stuff of my childhood. Are you first generation? I'm it complicated. Um, uh, of I'm course. born. Every uh, human being is. here yeah. is complicated. Right. So, um, in this way, I'm a little bit like your father. I was born in the U.S., but then we went back to Iran. No, my father. Right, right, right. But yeah. he, he moved when he had to go back. Okay. Right? Um, right. So, I'm both a U.S. citizen and an immigrant at I the same see. time. I see. Um, and. Um, and so there was that wonderful conversation. Um, and then at some point, uh, 10 years, 15 years later, she asked me to do the blogging, um, which became a kind of spiritual practice oh, of lovely. moving through the week, waiting for whatever comes. Yeah. And sometimes it's conversation with my beautiful partner, Corina. Sometimes it's a hike in Moyer Woods. Sometimes it's reflecting on heartache and challenges of our world and personal life. And so it almost led me to open my heart, open my eyes, and be more attentive. Um, and I'm so grateful, so grateful for that training and that opportunity. and. Um, where it leads us in the future. You had clearly written before, uh, but writing in that particular way perhaps gave you a new form of expression. I have a friend who says that he has to write to know what he is thinking. Is that how you feel? Um, you know, I think writing in some ways is a very, um, it, it's a recept, I experience it as a receptive process that uh, my job is to actually get myself out of the way. Um, and I know the finished thing looks like something that I would do. It's, it's love and it's justice and it's always love and justice in some <laughs> combination. It's fairly boring, love and justice. Um, I'd be very happy to spend a few lifetimes on those two. Um, but I really do feel like it's, it's he, it's she, it's, mm. it's the cosmic mm. awe and wonder flowing through us. Yeah. And so the more we can just get our ego out of the way, or as we say in North Carolina, get over your own damn self, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, then then I think wonder happens, and that tends to be how I experience it. But isn't that precisely what happens through meditation? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I want to take a moment and also say, uh, Amin's writing, um, one of the things that always startled me about the columns he was writing is that they were so fast. 
know, something would happen in the world and I'd still be trying to figure out how I felt about it or where I wanted it to evolve to or you know, how to put the pieces together. And there it was. And he hmm. said it so amazingly. I said, I wish I'd written that. <laughs> you know, every time. Thank you, Sharon. That, but that you know, I, I, I was thinking in those periods of silence yes. that we've experienced several times today, I was thinking, why don't I do this more often? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> because as soon as I walk into the, my apartment, I turn the radio yeah, on. That's right. And there's rarely silence in my apartment until about half an hour before I go to sleep, and then I turn everything yeah. off. Yeah. But silence is such a, um, I realized today that it, it really sort of put me in touch with my thoughts and feelings yeah, in, yeah, in yeah. ways I haven't yeah, been yeah, yeah. of late. I've been just going nutsy all over the place. Yeah, yeah. But to be silent, uh, oh, I think so. I mean, uh, I was going to ask you a question earlier in the plan, um, uh, which had to do with listening, because my guess would be that the secret power of uh, a great interviewer is the ability to listen. And I think it's the same thing. We're, we're listening in meditation to our own experience in a deeper level. We're connected where we may have felt uh, disconnected before. Um, we just become aware in, in some way that is so simple and yet so profound. And I think many people, um, you know, we're just not used to it. And uh, so many messages tell us, walk into that apartment and turn on the radio. Yeah. Uh, that you can't yeah. simply be. You can't be disconnected. You've always got to be, well, I, in my own case, I think certainly after John died, it was a desire, even after he moved into assisted living, I didn't want to be alone. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be alone in a silent apartment. But on, on the talk show business, I've always thought it should not be called a talk show. Mm -hmm. It ought to be called a listening show. Because I think that the most important job that I have done as a host is to learn to listen and to learn to hear um, things that are not said and, and to um, look at the spaces that exist in those pauses or, and hear that and try to bring it out. Mm -hmm. um, so I think listening is the most important thing that a good talk show host can learn to do. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. But today was an even yeah. deeper lesson. Yeah, that's fabulous. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think if I'm reading uh, these magical little numbers in front of us correct, um, we have used up at least the earthly finite time uh, into a conversation that deserves to expand into silence and infinity. But I, was, I would love to just invite you as our honored guest, if you have a parting word to encourage our friends here. I think that what I have felt and learned over all these years is that, um, oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, I got married six months ago. Mm. I forgot to tell them. 
That's why I called him a great love of your <laughs> yes, life. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, and, and I'll just tell a very quick story that um, I was on book tour uh, for the book that talked about John's death, uh, called On My Own, because I really did think after he died, I would be on my own for the rest of my life. I thought 54 years of marriage was enough and that um, I would sort of enjoy having this new life on my own. So I'm on book tour. I come home. There's a stack of mail because I've been gone for three weeks. And in it is a letter, an old-fashioned letter from a man whose name I recognized, but that was all I remembered. And he said, you and I met through friends 30 years ago, and I certainly remembered the friends. And he said, um, so sorry about your husband. My wife died five years ago. And if you are ever in Florida, where he lives, um, I'd love to take you for a cup of coffee. And I like that line. <laughs> it wasn't a drink, it wasn't dinner, a cup of coffee. So cigarettes, cool champagne, <laughs> and a cup of coffee. He's the He's ready to say He's it. right. He's serving for dark chocolate. <laughs> So he had put his email on there. He, 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 I, I sent him an email and I said, well, how nice of you to write. And as a matter of fact, I will be in Florida next month. And um, um, I had no idea of geography. He lives in West Palm Beach and I was speaking in Orlando. So I said, you know, if you'd like to come to that, be happy to see you. He drove three and a half hours to get there. There were 1,500 people in the audience. He was one of 500 who paid extra for a photograph and a signature. And as he was leaving, he turned around and looked at me, and I swear to God, I turned around and looked at him. He's got these huge blue eyes, and something happened. So we were married six months ago. So here's my parting shot and the title of my new book. Never say never <laughs> about anything. You can do whatever you set your mind to. Never say never. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Loved it.